challenging us to start thinking differently than the world. To start understanding that everything we need in life comes from Him and Him alone. That every good thing comes from the Father of all. And so he, he taught that, and then he transitions and begins teaching um, on how God loves us, but how to love our enemies. This morning's title is called Unlovable, How God Loves You and How to Love Your Enemies. So how many of you like lovable things in your life? I mean, what are some things that you just find just so lovable? You just Yes, with something that's lovable. What? Your dog. Your dog? So dogs, puppies, how many of you like a puppy or a kitten? Yeah. Few people. Some of you don't. Some of you are like, I hate them and I'm allergic to them. That's okay. You have other what's some other things that you find really lovable? Your baby. Your baby. Oh, that's a sweet little baby. Just like two little chunky legs in their cheeks. They're lovable. My residence. Your residents, the people you care for. God's given you that, that grace. We just love these people that God's put in your care. It's amazing how people who God puts can sometimes become like children to us. We, we care for them. Anyone else? What is something you just find lovable? I, I tell you what really warms my heart. <coughs> when I see a brand new motorcycle and that's the steam <laughs> and the sun on the, on the, on the tank and, and the smell of the exhaust and the rev of the engine. It just, it's so lovable. I mean, it's a good uh, a Ducati or something. It's just so lovable. Uh, anyone else with me? No? Okay. All right. Well, at least maybe. Some of you, uh, it's easy to understand there's things in life that are lovable. You know, and why are they lovable to us? There's, there's, a, there's a level of, of something we're getting from them, aren't we? It makes it so low. There's, there's just something sweet. There's something good. Generally, when we say that something is lovable, what we're saying is it deserves our affection. It deserves our attention. The people we care for, we, they, for whatever, they deserve love. They deserve attention. And so we, we want to love them. Little puppies and kittens are just so fluffy and innocent. They're innocent. Innocence deserves love, right? Some of you say, well, just let those kids get a little bit bigger. They're not so innocent after that. But they're still lovable. But they're still lovable? There's times that, how many of you have lovable things in your life that became a little harder to love? We have a 105 pound, nine month old puppy in our house. <laughs> She started out very cute. She's still gorgeous. But when she starts chewing your shoes or, or, or just can now destroy a whole cow leg, you can imagine the damage this lovable creature can do. <laughs> Kids, babies, they're so lovable, so cute. And then, and then they look at you for the first time and say, no. They're a little harder to love in those moments. Or just seem a little less lovable. We have people in our lives that maybe the first time you met them, your heart leaped and you know, those butterflies. You're like, oh, this is the greatest man or woman in the world. I, oh, I love them. And then you get to know them and you find out they're not so perfect. And sometimes they're just jerks. It can be a little bit harder to, to see them as lovable. Which brings us to, if there are lovable things in this world, that means there's also the opposite. There's unlovable things in this world. Now, we could argue that what one person finds lovable, someone else may not find lovable. Some people just love their cute little baby snakes. And other people are like, no, thank you. Uh -huh. <laughs> we were uh, watching with the kids. Uh, this ended up being a horrible idea. So we watched a movie with the kids, and it was about this prehistoric shark that is bigger than any shark that is in the sea today. A shark so big, it can bite an entire whale. 
in half. Now, this shark, halfway through the movie, becomes very unlovable because it is a big, hungry monster. And my son, who's a little sensitive, began to start to cry. And he's angry at the people who produced this movie, saying, they are ruining the ocean for everyone. <laughs> that shark was not very lovable. It was not innocent in, in the, the eyes of the people that it was trying to eat. So killer prehistoric sharks, maybe, maybe farther on the unlovable side. What are some things that we find unlovable sometimes? Slow car in front of you. Slow car in front of you. Yes, it can sometimes be as, as something as benign as, as, as people getting in our way. Who loves that? Slow traffic, things not going my way. Noisy motorcycles. <laughs> <laughs> Noisy motorcycles. You will be my first stop, brother, if I got the last name. Yeah. Our big idea this morning that we're looking at is unconditional love is giving others what they need the most, even if they deserve it the least. That is how Jesus calls us to love the unlovable, to love our enemies. So there's things that are definitely unlovable in this world. Acts of terrorism, violence, abuse of all kinds. There's things in this world that are unlovable things. There are people in this world, let's be honest, have not done very much to help themselves be lovable. For whatever reason, maybe they were harmed or damaged themselves. But the reality is that there are lovable things in this world that we love to love. We love to love these things. And then there are things in this world that it is a fight and it is a struggle to have compassion and to care about these things. How many of you can understand why it took the rest of the church a little bit of time, the rest of the apostles some time, to welcome Paul, who had previously been called Saul. If you don't know uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, before he had his encounter with Jesus and was blinded by a light, knocked off a horse, and, and, and blinded, had this encounter, and Jesus said, Paul, why are you, or Saul, why are you persecuting me? And God changed his life and brought. There's a reason why other people didn't like him. He killed him. He had been overseeing, he had been holding the coats so that other people could kill Christians. How many of you would have had a little hard time loving Saul if you had seen him at that point? If you knew this about him and he showed up to your church, showed up to your synagogue or whatever that next day or whatever you were meeting, how many of you would be a little suspicious and a little worried? <laughs> there are things that happen in this world. There are things that people do or say, simply, that in our eyes can make them unlovable. Are we all on the same page, be honest about that. <clears throat> and so to that, Jesus says this in Luke chapter 6, verse 27 through 36. What's amazing is as he's teaching this, there are people in this group that hate Jesus. There are people in the group, the Pharisees, that we keep seeing over and over trying to trip him up and trying to get him arrested. They are listening to him teach this message. Talk about having to practice what you preach. Verse 27. 
But to you who are willing to listen, I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who hurt you. Now, if the disciples around him at that time are just like us, and we know that they were, and we put ourselves in that time, put ourselves into the story, I want us just imagine for a moment. You've never heard this before. Jesus is the only person teaching this kind of stuff in any religion, anywhere in the world. You've been told your whole life that, that you are the special group of people and that everyone against you is against God and we can level them and that's cool. And then all of a sudden, this person that you greatly admire that's been healing people and God's power is with, all of a sudden tells you, hey, I want you to love your enemies. I want you to do good to those who hate you, not do bad. I want you to pray for God's blessing over those who would pray and seek for your demise. Pray, intercede for those who want to hurt you. If we're honest, we might begin to wrestle with, is this the person we want to follow? This is not my natural inclination. This is not Jared's flesh that naturally wants to do these things. And I think it's really important we look at this word, that word love can be so confusing, particularly in the English language. We say we love our spouse, we say we love our kids, we we love our coffee, we love our motorcycles, we love deer hunting, we love this, this, we, we love everything. But what, is, what does it really mean? In the Bible, there's different words that are used for love. There's, there's a, but there's a, uh, a love that basically just means to, to brotherly, camaraderie, love, family love. There is the, the eros, the erotic, or kind of a love, a passion between two people. There's also this other one called agape, which means unconditional love. When it says that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believed in him would have life and not have to die, it's saying God had this unconditional affection, and not even affection, but this, this, this intent Think of love as not necessarily, this kind of love isn't just something that rises up within you. This type of love is an intention. It is a, is a purpose. This unconditional love that God said, even though they don't deserve it, I'm going to give them what they need the most, which is me. And I'm going to do it in flesh through my Son, Jesus, who I will give them. They don't deserve him. They don't deserve me. But that's what they need the most. And so I, because I believe in unconditional love, will give that to them. Does that make sense? It is that kind of love that God has given us. It is that kind of love that Jesus is saying, I am giving you. You are to give that to other people. And all of us, as we read scripture, all of us at one point were enemies of God. All of us at different point have been rebellious and, and have wanted to do the opposite of what God wants done. Am I the only one there? If we're going to be honest, if we're going to be fair, each and every single one of us at some point in our existence has been an enemy of God.
and yet he loved us. He had an intent to give us what we needed the most, even when we deserved it the least. He did good towards us even when we hated him. He blessed us even though we may have cursed his name. He was interceding and working and, and calling us to him even though we might have been trying to hurt his creation, hurt him, hurt his will and purpose. Verse 29, if someone slaps you on one cheek, offer the other cheek also. If someone demands your coat, offer your shirt also. Give to anyone who asks. And when things are taken away from you, don't try to get them back. Do to others as you would like them to do to you. A little context, and particularly in that culture, one of the most insulting ways you could insult someone would be to, to slap them across the face. If you really want to insult someone, you took your sandal off and you threw your shoe at them, or you hold your shoe over their head, saying basically, you are beneath the junk on the bottom of my shoe. And so you might be arguing with somebody, and someone gets mad and just slaps you across the face. Now, I don't know how your response might be, but my response is generally, Block jab. Okay, that's what I would want to do. And yes, well, there is a point where we are, there's nothing wrong with, obviously, if somebody's attacking you or someone to, to uh, protect yourself. You have children, you probably don't want to get killed, so you can continue to take care of your children. But there's something deep happening here is there's basically, there's not a real th threat, it's just a, more of a threat to the person's dignity. And there may be a point even where actually there is a physical threat to us. And we have the capacity to completely destroy the other person. And Jesus says, no, don't. Someone slaps you on the cheek, offer the other cheek also. If someone insults you, Rather than insulting them back, what would it look like if you said, you need to hit me again? Here. If you really feel you need to say those things to me, say it. Yeah, that's a much better way to respond. Rather than it's returning insult for insult, that's our natural response, isn't it? Or to fire back with a yow butt. Christians, we even Christians, we have big butts. We have big yow butts, and they'll say something to us, and we'll say, "Oh yeah, well, how about this?" There's this little term in, in communication called spike talk. And if you've been in a couple's communication class or counseling, um, or you've had communication classes, there's this thing called spike talk. And I was really, really good at it. Really good at it as a young man. No one had to teach me. It was just natural gifting, I guess. And I had a way of, of, of my mom would say something and try to correct or steer me. And whether she was right or not, wrong, that, that's, that, that's beside the point. The point is, I would respond in a certain way. Now, I wasn't swearing at my mother. I wasn't yelling at my mother. But I would say things that weren't bad, but I would say them in such a way that it just put a little knife in a mother's heart and twisted it. How we respond to people. Is how we love or don't love people. 
Someone may not deserve to get a kind word in response to their attack to us. But it's not about what they deserve. That's one of the hardest things to, to get in our heads about following Jesus, is Jesus is not so concerned about us helping other people get what they deserve. The kingdom of God is about helping people acquire what they don't deserve. What none of us have deserved. So if someone insults you, they slap you on a cheek, offer the other cheek also. If someone demands your coat, offer your shirt also. People are broken and they have needs. And people will sometimes try to meet those needs in very unhealthy ways. They might be jealous. They've got a better coat than I've got. And you're talking to someone, they're like, boy, it must be nice to be able to afford a coat like that. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Never mind, you save three years worth of birthday money because you don't have any money. And then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit tells you, give them your coat. We have a decision at that point, and this could apply to many different things. Do we obey the Holy Spirit and show Christ-like love, which is something they're not deserving? And there's a couple responses that can come out of that, and there's a reason why Jesus is, is calling us to, to act this way. Give to anyone who asks, and when things are taken away from you, don't try to get them back. Do to others as you would like them to do to you. How many of you have had things taken away that you weren't too happy about, whether it be special privileges or, or, uh, or maybe a job promotion or something, or something that you deserved and it was taken away and given to someone who didn't deserve it? I think we've all probably had that in one capacity. Then we had to make a choice. Do I accept this and, and pray and let God lead me through this, or do I scheme and plot how to bring them down? That's been my default setting for a long time. How are we responding? Now when we do that, there's a couple ways people, people might respond. One, they're going to be shocked, most likely. They're going to be shocked. What? What? Now, just to prepare you, if God tells you to do something like that, let's say you've got that, that beautiful coat, uh, in case you like animals, we'll say it's a non fur coat, and uh, it's just this beautiful coat, and somebody giving you the business over it, and you can tell there's some jealousy there. You can tell that there's, for some reason, there's something in their life, maybe. They don't have a, a nice coat or whatever this story is in your mind. And God says, give it to them, and you do. Now, how we obey God is just as important as obeying God. Now, we can say, well, the Bible says, if I ask for my coat, give my coat, and take it off and roll it up. And throw it like, fine, take it. <laughs> there, Jesus, I obey you. Where's my blessing now? How we love people is as important as us loving people. See, giving your coat, that is an act of agape, an act of unconditional love. Giving them what they needed, in that case, what they thought they needed, even though they didn't deserve it. But how we show that love is just as important as the action itself. I can be obedient to my parents, I could finally do what my mom said, but my responses to why I was obeying her was not so loving and not so kind. Now imagine instead of just taking it off, rolling it up, throwing it out, say, there, how do you feel now? What if instead we look at them with compassion and say, you know what? 
how I got this code, that doesn't matter. What matters is something's bothering me. And I don't want this to be between us. And obviously, maybe you just you need a code, so I just want to give this to you. I feel God wants you to have this. And you take it off, and you very gently present it to me. A couple things could happen, just to warn you. One, they might start crying and take your coat. They might get mad at you, but still take your coat. And they may even break down and say, you know what, it's not about the coat. You keep your coat. Let me tell you what I really need. And then you get to have a conversation about the brokenness. About how somebody else took something from them. And you get to share Jesus, and you get to share healing, and you get to share restoration with them. We are called to give people what they need, even if they don't deserve it, because that opens the door for us to give them Jesus, which they need, even if they don't deserve it. Verse 32, if you love only those who love you, why should you get credit for that? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good only to those who do good to you, why should you get credit? Even sinners do that much. And if you lend money only to those who can repay you, why should you get credit? It's kind of funny, like lending money to someone who already has money to pay it back. Even sinners will lend to other sinners for a full return. What Jesus is saying, he said, I'm not asking you, I'm asking you to give to others what they need without expectation of getting anything from them in return. Why do we invest in relationships? We invest in relationships because it's an investment. There's a return. I love and take care of you, you love and take care of me. That's what friends do, right? That's what, when we stand and a couple comes together, they, 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 they make their vows, they're committing to, to give the other person what they need, whether they deserve it or not. And if you have two people committed to giving the other person what they need, rather than worrying about taking what they need, everyone gets their needs met. But there's, Within that, that marriage contract, there is that safety. We're committed to this. We've taken an evaluation of what we have and what we don't have, what we bring to this relationship, what we don't bring to the relationship, and we're agreeing that, okay, I'm, I'm putting this on the table, and you're putting that on the table, and we're coming together. Other relationships in life don't necessarily work that way. That one person you've met only once in your life, there's a good chance you're not going to get returned back from them for your kindness to them. Jesus is wanting us to give without expectation of return. One of the craziest, most beautiful things about God is that he has offered his love and his grace and his mercy. He died for every single living person who was and is and ever will be knowing that many will reject him and have nothing to do with him. He invested, he gave everything to us Without the guarantee, we have free will of whether or not we would accept him or not. Think of this on a personal level. Jesus died for you, knowing that you may not love him back. Now as we dwell on that, it makes us love him even more, doesn't it? It makes us in awe of his grace and his mercy even more. We are to do without expectation of return from the other person. 
because every good thing comes from our Father. Everything we need comes from Him. We don't need affirmation from the other person. We don't need recognition of our good works from the other person. We don't need a thank you from the other person. We simply need the love and, and, and the care from our Father. And I guarantee you, when you walk in obedience to what God is calling you to, However, the other person's response, when we stop and we get with our Father, you will feel our Father smile upon you. You will feel the heart of God that is happy that you shared His love, and your blessings and your benefit will be beyond what you could have expected from any individual person. Verse 35, love your enemies, do good to them, lend to them without expecting to be repaid. Then your reward from heaven will be very great, and you will truly be acting as children of the Most High. For He is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. Man, that's a rough verse. God is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. Jesus is saying these words. These are some heavy, heavy words. And I think that's something that uh, we really need to set. We forget sometimes how unthankful we can be of the blessings God has given us. We forget how wicked we all can be. The heart is deceitfully wicked. Every single one of us. Yet God was kind to us. Love the song is his kindness that leads us to repentance. And so if we are sharing God's kindness with the world around us, even though they may be unthankful and wicked, as we show that kindness, that is more likely to lead them to change, lead them to repentance, lead them to accept Jesus, lead them to accept God, than if we war and fight and try to destroy them. Verse 36, Jesus says, You must be compassionate just as your Father is compassionate. Compassionate. We will not be able, we will really struggle to do what God's calling us to do in the right way without compassion. The difference between me taking off my coat and throwing it at somebody in anger Versus me taking off my coat and handing it to them in a gentle, loving way is compassion. I'm giving what God is calling me to give. I'm doing what God is calling me to do. I'm serving in the way God is calling me to serve. Not because anyone deserves it. Not because I'm just angry and trying to be obedient. But because I have allowed God to give me his compassion. I have compassion for them. I see their brokenness, I see their lostness, I see the enslavement of the demonic powers that are around them, and I desire for them to be set free, healed, and made whole. So in conclusion this morning, some questions that we can ask ourselves, and I want us to go back and just read through this again this week, and let God speak to us. One, who is my enemy? Who is my enemy? Some will say, well, I don't have any enemies. Who do we consider an enemy? This is the person on television of a different religion who's shouting death to my nation.
Is my enemy someone who belongs to a different political party? I feel that their values are trying to destroy my own culture. Is my enemy an ex-wife or husband? Is it a current wife or husband? Is my enemy a co-worker? Who is my enemy? Who do I think hates me? Who do I think wishes me harm? Who has hurt me, either intentionally or accidentally, in my life? Just because there's not a current threat does not mean we don't see someone as an enemy. So how do we love our enemies? We ask this question. What does that person need? What does that person need? Is there a need in that person's life that God has or is equipping us to meet? Is there a need in that person's life that God has or is equipping me personally to meet or that person? If the answer is yes, that is how we can love that enemy, we can love that person. 